proceed to a report stage of the Petroleum and Other Minerals Development Prohibition of Onshore Hydraulic Fracturing uh, Bill 2016. Uh, amendment uh, 1 in the name of Deputies uh, Breed Smith, uh, Boyd Barrett, and Gino Kenny. Uh, Deputy Boyd Barrett moving. Amendment move. number one, he moves. Thank you. Yeah, uh, first of all, let me say, uh, last King on Corla, that um, I very much welcome uh, the fact that uh, the prohibition of uh, onshore fracking bill has reached this point uh, and that we're on the brink of, um, I would say, a historic decision to uh, prohibit and ban uh, fracking onshore. Um, that is a very, very positive development, uh, and I commend uh, Deputy Tony McLaughlin for his uh, his bill uh, for getting it uh, this far. Um, and beyond that, and I think he would uh, accept this, uh, that the greatest credit of all goes to the communities. Uh, in a number of parts of the country that have fought and the environmental groups that have fought uh, to, to reach a point where we would take the decision to ban uh, fracking. Um, I think we're all fairly well versed in the reasons why that should be the case. Uh, from the point of view of the local communities in places like Leitrim or Fermanagh or other counties which might be affected uh, by uh, fracking, it would obviously pose really a mortal threat to uh, water quality, to uh, the unique uh, landscape uh, and environment uh, that we enjoy in this country, uh, potentially doing immense damage to farming, to, uh, uh, to tourism uh, and to heritage, uh, to wildlife. Uh, and to human health. Uh, so for all of those reasons, uh, it is critically important that it is uh, banned on uh, the onshore. But there are other reasons why, as our series of amendments suggest, uh, that the ban should not just be on the onshore, but should extend to the offshore. Uh, the most important is the fact that uh, we are in a race uh, against time on the question of climate change. Uh, Ireland is already uh, pitifully failing uh, to reach uh, our uh, targets in terms of reducing CO2 emissions into the environment. Uh, we are tragically, in my opinion, uh, making special pleading to the European Union, and it would appear we've been somewhat successful, uh, that uh, we should enjoy more flexibility uh, in terms of reaching those uh, targets, uh, uh, allowing us to have, if you like, less ambitious targets in reducing CO2 uh, emissions uh, because of um, uh, agriculture in this, uh, in this country. Uh, I think that's wrong. Uh, don't get me wrong, I think we have to fight to defend our farmers uh, and their interests, but I think there are other ways to do it uh, than special pleading to get out of uh, the um, imperative that uh, we should be fully part of and indeed playing a leading role in uh, ensuring that we tackle runaway climate change as a matter of absolute urgency uh, and should be a model country. Uh, indeed, precisely because of our heritage, because of the unique environmental uh, qualities uh, of this country, we should be leading the, uh, the charge uh, for radical action to reduce CO2 uh, emissions. And against uh, that background uh, of having to reach targets of potentially, if we don't reach our targets, and I think at the moment, uh, signs on it, we won't. We could be pay, uh, facing billions of euros in fines uh, by the EU. Against that kind of background, given the threat that climate change represents, uh, to my mind, the idea that we would seek to uh, 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 
discover and extract more hydrocarbons through uh, other methods beyond the sort of uh, the, the uh, exploration that we already have uh, in conventional uh, uh, extraction uh, methods is simply just unconscionable. Uh, the vast, vast majority of hydrocarbons have to stay in the ground if we are to have any chance uh, of dealing with uh, uh, climate change uh, and we should be taking a lead by saying in that context we are not going to engage uh, in uh, fracking um, uh, either on the onshore or uh, the offshore. Uh, and this was something that indeed in the bill that uh, I introduced back in 2015 was included uh, in our own uh, bill. Uh, the government in their wisdom didn't bring that bill forward uh, to committee stage. I'm very glad Deputy McLaughlin's bill has come forward but nonetheless uh, I think uh, is, is lacking in, the, uh, in its failure uh, to apply the ban uh, to, the off, uh, to the offshore. And it is sadly part of uh, a, a more general failure of this government to take seriously uh, the imperative to deal with climate change and take the sort of radical action that is necessary to do so. The other point I would make uh, is the potential damage. I mean, we acknowledge rightly the, the potential damage to health, to the environment, to wildlife, uh, to the landscape, uh, to farming and so on. Uh, onshore, uh, all of these dangers, all of these dangers apply equally uh, to the offshore. And when you look at the experience uh, of offshore fracking that is taking place off the coast of the United States, in the Gulf, uh, off uh, other areas of the US coastline, Line where billions, tens of billions of toxic wastewater of chemicals are pouring into uh, the oceans, poisoning marine life, uh, putting in uh, chemicals uh, which damage uh, human life, uh, uh, seriously threatening the eco, uh, the marine uh, ecosystem. Uh, it, to my mind, uh, it is an absolute imperative uh, that we ban the offshore uh, fracking as well. And very finally, last can call it that the definition uh, of uh, what we have to ban isn't just about fracking but is about any forms of fracking like extraction uh, that potentially could have the same damaging effects or could put the same toxic materials uh, into the sea, into the land, into the water uh, uh, and I believe the, the bill is a bit deficient in how it has defined that because the processes of fracking are very likely to change uh, and this bill may not uh, capture them. I support the bill but I believe it needs these amendments uh, to give us uh, the full uh, strength uh, that it deserves to have. Chuck, uh, sorry, Deputy, Deputy Kelly was first and then Deputy Ryan. Uh, first of all, I want to commend yeah, I, Deputy McLaughlin. Just McLaughlin's in case I didn't remind you that uh, one to five inclusive are related and been discussed together. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, to commend Deputy McLaughlin. Uh, for bringing the bill to the House, as you're aware, we also had a bill, Sinn Féin had a similar bill in regard to a ban on fracking, as had many others here, and it is uh, one of the unique occasions when there's cross-party support for trying to get this over the line, and that is to be commended. Um, the first thing I want to say is that the number of people that are in the gallery and the people from all over the country that are watching this, it's really a victory for them more than anyone else, and while Tony McLaughlin, of course, deserves great credit for it. It's really been the pressure that has been built up over the last number of years by all of those people up and down the length and breadth of the country, many of them in my own constituency and in County Clare and other areas, who have brought this, uh, Sean, a very bright light on the dangers that is involved in this process of hydraulic fracturing. Now, the, the bill, when it began its life, was about the geology was about coal seams, was about the, the shale rock and about tight sands and about ensuring that any gas that would be extracted for them would not be allowed to be extracted. And it didn't go into the process which we call fracturing, which was, we understood at the time, the way forward and the best way of dealing to, with it to ensure that, as Deputy Boyd Barrett said, that no new process could come on which could be slightly different from fracturing, maybe squeezing the rock or finding some other way of doing it that would have the same effect in that it would have the same environmental dangers. However, it has developed a little bit differently that now it is not a bill to do that, that it is in effect an amendment to the 1960 Petroleum Act, 
However, it does what we need it to do. And, you know, in, in, in many of these things in life, and while I, I fully accept what Deputy Boyd Barrett is saying, sometimes the perfect can be the enemy of the good. And, you know, if we strive to get this absolutely perfect, we may find ourselves in a situation that we don't get what we need to achieve here. The, the issue of offshore, and, and indeed, um, first of all, I want to say that I'm, I'm deputising on behalf of, of Deputy Brian Stanley here this evening, and he had an amendment down which he wishes to withdraw. So we want to withdraw that amendment, which was about looking at the offshore aspect of it. And the reason for that is because we have convinced by a number of individuals and a number of groups out there that the offshore aspect of it makes it too complex to be able to get this bill over the line and to be sure that we get it done within the lifetime of this doll. So that's the reason why we feel that it is more appropriate to withdraw from that and to simply focus on the onshore aspect of it. Because we have been explained to us by geologists and others that when conventional gas is extracted in, in wells offshore, that there's a process of pressure used which could be described as a type of fracking. And that if we try to expand our uh, ban on hydraulic fracturing to offshore, that in effect we could be banning conventional gas extraction. And to do so would put it into a different legal tangle where it could be maybe sent to the Attorney General or whoever else and delay the bill and end up, that we end up with no doll and the bill not going through. And we don't want to see that happen. So what we're proposing instead is that we will withdraw our amendment, that we will support the bill as it stands, and that when the bill goes through, that we would look at an all-party group coming together for to develop an alternative amendment to the 1960 Petroleum Act, which would look at fracking offshore, and then come up with a comprehensive amendment to the 1960 Petroleum Act, which would ensure that hydraulic fracturing offshore can be banned. But we want to ensure that we don't complicate the issue right now and possibly allow this bill to fall. So the, the final remarks I want to make is that uh, all of us when we come here have an awful lot of division and we're always fighting with each other about different things and we're always coming up with different problems that we've got but at the end of the day this is one thing which I'm delighted to say we have unanimity on and that's one of the good things that we have here is that everyone is together on this that we want to ensure that the process of hydraulic fracturing is banned and banned for good. Now if the industry comes up with some alternative way of doing it in the future we'll have to look at that then but for now at least if we can secure this and get this over the line, I think we make a strong statement, not only here in Ireland but to the world, that hydraulic fracturing is a process which is dangerous, which is wrong and which should be banned. And indeed, uh, their last, um, last February I attended a conference by the Interparliamentary Union in the United Nations in New York and it was about the oceans of the earth and the dangers that various processes was having to the oceans, including pollution. And one of the big things they were talking about was gas and oil exploration and the dangers that they were having. And I made the case to them there that Ireland was putting through its parliament a proposal for to ban hydraulic fracturing, and that we led the way in that sense, and that was something that the rest of the world should look at. But the, pro the point is that if we have the opportunity to lead the way, we shouldn't just stop here. We shouldn't just ban it on shore and stop at that. We need to work to ensure that we expand it to the, to the offshore aspect of it as well and that we look at ensuring that if in the future we need to strengthen this legislation, that if the process in some way changes or, or develops in some way, that we also can be ensured that any extraction of gas or oil from tight sands, from coal seams or from shale rock is banned and prohibited for good. So again, I want to commend the bill to the House and I would suggest to the, the, the other proponents of the other uh, uh, amendments that they should think about it because really the argument here is, is as I say, ensuring that the perfect does not become the enemy of the good and that we get this over the line and when we have that done we all work together and I understand that time is of the essence but you know, I feel we have the time and we have the energy and we have the commitment from everyone in this chamber to ensure that we then look at banning hydraulic fracturing offshore as well. Uh, Deputy Ryan, seven minutes. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Las Cancorla. Um, I think for the environmental movement this is a historic day, this is a historic bill because what we're doing is not insignificant, it is um, a significant statement, it's so significant uh, Mick Wallace's phone is celebrating, um, <laughs> but it's significant because it's a significant for the, for the communities, for local communities, particularly in Leitrim, uh, Roscommon, Sligo area but, uh, and in Clare but also for the wider thing about what it says about our future, our future without fossil fuels, a statement of confidence, a statement of intent,
that we can actually live on alternative resources, live on our own resources, our natural resources, which are not going to emit greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which are not going to pollute our water, which is not going to pollute the air that we breathe. I want to commend, like uh, speakers previously, um, Deputy Tony M M M McLaughlin and the Minister for um, their work in getting this bill in presenting it. I think it's also important for this doll that this is the first, as I understand, of the kind of private members' bills which have been published in huge numbers in the last year. Their question in the Business Committee and other committees in this House is how come we're not getting them through committee stage? How come we're not getting them through report stage? We're doing that tonight, and it's a significant, significant bill in that regard. Um, I want to commend, as other people have, the community groups who I think have led this campaign and have done it in a really positive, constructive manner. The likes of Love Leitrim, I've seen them up on top of mountains with bonfires, I've seen them outside the door dressed as cows, as well, Lord knows what not, but they've been positive, they've been confident in about what they're doing, they've uh, ran a brilliant campaign. I want to commend the likes of the Good Energy Alliance, who I've had the great pleasure of meeting up in Leitrim on a number of occasions, where they've held seminars, they've been thinking about the alternatives, thinking in depth about the technological alternatives, thinking in depth with other campaigners uh, about what the real uh, environmental risks are with fracking. It's a great day for people in those organisations. I want to commend Friends of the Earth for their support in, in, in helping draft the bill and bringing in their international expertise and their kind of uh, uh, people, the likes of Kate Ruddock and others who I think are here, I think who've done a great job just consistently um, working with this House, representatives of this House, to make sure that this bill gets over the line. There are many others, too many to mention, Frack Free Ireland and a whole range of other community groups. I've seen them down in Clare, as I said, down in the Loophead Peninsula, where you're going from one farm to the next and people are out there saying, we don't want fracking here. It's a great day for them. But more than anything else, the reason why it's a great day is because we face an existential threat uh, in, in the release of carbon dioxide and uh, methane uh, and other greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, which we are, have an urgency from the Green Party's perspective. It does, it's an existential crisis that we have to address and we have to play our part in. And the great thing about this is that we can all play our part in it. It's the villages in Leitrim that actually are at the front line here. Every village and every community has a chance to play the part and that is what we are doing. And similarly, in a house here which has been divided on water for so long, for us on this issue of water quality, particularly the source of our Shannon, the source of so much the river waters that run through our, our land to say we're not going to risk, as we heard the scientific evidence in the committees, there were risks if we frack down into this uh, source of shale that the fractures and the natural fractures in the, in the rock, the geological fractures, would see some of the pollutants that are put down to collect the gases seeping into our water uh, re resources. It's significant for that reason. With regard to Deputy Boyd Barrett's amendment, I fully commend and agree with the sentiment of us wanting to stop uh, fracking uh, uh, in any possible location, and indeed our sea waters are ten times the size of our land area. But I'm afraid on this occasion I'd have to agree with, I think, Sinn Féin's intention that to say, yes, we agree in spirit, but actually I think we're better getting this bill through today. We're better making real certainty in terms of absolute, categoric end to any hydraulic fracking on our land. I don't believe, I think the water or the issue at sea is a more complicated issue. We saw that last week. We were debating the mineral bill, the mineral bill in committee stage and for example just to make an example of the complications there there's a coal seam out in the Irish Sea that some people are looking at maybe going in and extracting out using gasification there's a whole range of different uh, legislative issues around when you go offshore as well as technical issues I think we're better to get this absolute cast iron certain through in terms of an end of fracking uh, onshore. I would ask the two parties, both Sinn Féin and the anti austerity Alliance, people before, sorry, people before profit, um, to actually go one step further in your amendments and actually for us to come back to this House and recognise that if we're to take climate change seriously, if we are really to listen to the scientists and heed what has to be done, then it's absolutely clear that we need to leave four-fifths of the known fossil fuel reserves underground. And that in turn means we have to put an end to offshore gas and oil exploration in our waters of, of, of the ordinary type and not just of fracking.
And that's not easy because a lot of parties and a lot of people have held up the prospect, oh, there's a great fortune out there in the Atlantic. I remember hearing figures of 60 billion or 600 billion, I can't remember how many billion that we were going to get and, and it would be, be our rescue. I'm sorry, that is no longer touchable if we're to take climate change seriously. So if we're to put amendments in about stopping exploration offshore, I agree 100%, but let us go further and let us stop the issuing and the use of licenses for any exploration for oil and gas offshore because that is what we have an obligation to do in my mind and we will come back with bills in that regard and look for the support of Sinn Féin and look for the support of the people bought profit because we believe it's the scale of response that we need to make. Lastly, why this is historic and important and I think in a sense the way we approach this bill because it is across the board, it is across the house. I, I, I regret that Mike Fosmaris, my, my colleague and neighbour here, isn't here because I saw the other night there was a row on about climate change and kind of there's always rows going on about God almighty wind farms, they're the problem and the grid is the problem and, and you Greens are causing all sorts of trouble with your different te technologies you want to bring in. We recognise that we have a problem in that regard. If we're giving up the use of fossil fuels, which is what we have to do, we have to have an alternative. The alternative the alternative is renewable, the alternative is solar, the alternative is wind. Now we have to get that right. We have to remain united and bring all communities with us. The same communities in Roscommon that were concerned about fracking, I know are concerned about onshore wind. I think a lot of the issues in the next few years are not going to be as difficult as one is in recent years because I think by and large with wind we're going to start going offshore and by and large we need to really start developing solar even in the cloudy northwest of this country. But we need to get that right. And the people who have been campaigning, the likes of the Good Energy Alliance, the likes of Love Leitrim, I think they have a job now ahead of them, as well as this great victory of saying no to fracking. We need to work out how we get really good at this alternative supply in the future, which is electric, in a future which is hyper-efficient, and those communities and those counties that are good at being efficient are the ones that are going to prosper. And more than anything else, a future where the energy resource is local, belongs to everyone, belongs to the people. Let's open up that future as we close the door on the history of fossil fuels oh here tonight. Oh Thank you. Uh, the next two offered is Deputy Wallace, and just uh, I have Deputy Brazel, Scanlon, Fergus Dowd and Murphy. Um, uh, we will be supporting the bill, um, but uh, I, I actually agree with Richard Bide Barrett. Um, I, I don't see uh, why uh, I still support the amendments, uh, but we will support the bill. So we're not jeopardising what we are getting today, and fair play to Tony McLaughlin, fair play to the people uh, who actually. Uh, put enough pressure on their TDs in the different areas to actually uh, force the government into this position because I don't genuinely believe that, uh, that, that, the, uh, that the government uh, have done a U-turn on how they feel about the environment, uh, the performance of this government and the one before it uh, on climate change has been uh, pathetic and uh, I, I really don't see a change of mindset but this is a uh, uh, a good moment, uh, but a drop in the ocean uh, towards uh, the bigger picture, and uh, we're continuing to destroy the environment here. <clears throat> it can be described as a perfect example of how the government couldn't care less about climate change and the environment, and the enduring duplicity of the Department of Communications, Climate Action and the Environment. The department has a section called the Petroleum Affairs Division, which grants licenses for oil and gas exploration and production. To quote from the department's website, the role of the Petroleum Affairs Division is to maximise the benefits to the state from exploration for and production of indigenous oil and gas resources. And it goes on to say, in doing this, we ensure that activities are conducted with due regard to their impact on the environment and other land and sea users. A new report by the World Wildlife Fund shows that since 1970 the number of wild animals on the planet has dropped by more than half and by 2020 it's expected to drop by two thirds. It's generally accepted that it's too late for most of the world's coral reefs in many parts of the world. Rainfall patterns are changing and, human and humans and wildlife are competing for diminishing sources of water. Oceans are undergoing acidification which is endangering plankton, the basic food for all aquatic life. Each year sees record temperatures being set and it's reported that we're about to see a record temperatures uh, for Ireland this, this month alone. Uh, 
Every child in every school that the Minister visits uh, knows that we have to keep fossil fuels in the ground. And this is the message that he promotes when he meets them, for example, at the Young Environmentalist Awards this week. Uh, the Minister urged children to reduce their carbon footprint and told the crowd of students that they are the people that will drive the change. It's an understandable position because no change is coming from the Government or the Department of the Environment and Climate Change. The Government's inaction on climate change is nothing less than intergenerational theft. It is the next generation's responsibility to clean up the mess. Only last week, the Minister was tweeting about the possibility of developing a gas storage facility on the Shannon Estuary to tie in with the gas-powered power stations in Ireland. He referred to gas as alternative fuel. The lie that has been propagated by the fossil fuel industry that gas is in any way, shape or form a green or so-called alternative source of energy generation is akin to the long uh, propaganda campaign by scientists in the pay of the tobacco companies who spread the lie that t tobacco does not harm your health. In fact, the very same scientists are involved in the climate change denial movement and are promoting the lie of gas as a greener alternative energy source. One of the main peddlers of this nonsense are Exxon Mobil, uh, who withheld decades of research that detailed the effects and advance of climate change and instead funded and promoted an entirely different story that contradicted its own findings through lobby groups and uh, bill mills such as Alec and Heartland Institute. Exxon Mobil is on the list of the portfolio of investments of the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund. And Exxon Mobil, going 50 50 with Statoil, were granted six oil and gas exploration and drilling licenses off the coast of Ireland last year. There were six of a total of 28 exploration licenses that were granted last year by a department that already has the words climate absurdly has the words climate action and environment in its title. Uh, our amendment is a litmus test for the government. When the minister and the government talk about climate action, is it all hot air? Uh, because if behind the government's apparent support for this bill there is a genuine concern for the environment, our wildlife and the health and safety of our people, then that logic surely also applies to the extraction of oil and gas off our shores. One wonders if there wasn't uh, such a legacy of bad planning and, and prevalence of once-off housing in the, in, the, in the counties where fracking was proposed, would the bill have got this far at all, uh, given that it was affecting so many people uh, be because of the spread of where people live in Ireland. Norman Klein says that it's not too late to keep temperatures below levels that would save millions of lives and livelihoods. Ireland are now the second worst performer in Europe on climate change action. We are busy destroying our children's futures and the lives and livelihoods of millions around the world, and all for a quick buck. Ireland had strict protections around children, and we even have laws that protect the rights of unborn children, and yet we have no legislation in place to stop outright the extraction of fossil fuels to protect the lives of all our children and future children. UNICEF has warned that more severe and more frequent natural disasters, food crises and changing rainfall patterns are all threatening children's lives and that by 2050 climate change could result in an additional 25 million children suffering from malnourishment. Now, all this could be undone by CETA, which is going to come into effect soon. We have God knows what, what effect it will have on everything. They, they'll actually be able to take cases against measures that we bring in if it in any way affects their prospects in making money. We were mad to sign up to CETA. But you know what? It's consistent with general government policy. We look across the different departments and we see the same philosophy. We've asked a number of ministers, agriculture and environment recently, uh, they keep using the word sustainable, but they won't define it for us. Sustainable, what does it mean to them? I mean, it seems to mean, the idea was that, oh, uh, they invented the word carbon neutral and sustainable, that, uh, oh, we, we, can, we can make money and we can still look after the environment. Well, you know what? The second part is losing out fairly bad. Oh my God because there is no genuine interest in tackling climate change in Ireland. Um, at the outset, can I say that Fianna Fáil will be supporting this bill, and I want to commend Deputy Mid Lachlan on bringing 
uh, the bill forward um, and also very much welcome the cross-party support, which in itself sends out a very positive message. And when many of the countries of the G8 are ploughing ahead uh, with fracking policy, um, I believe that it's uh, exemplary that Ireland are taking a stand on this and shining a light and maybe giving campaigners all over the world who are vehemently against hydraulic fracking that at least there is one country standing up and saying no. Um, I also welcome uh, the withdrawal of the amendment um, by Sinn Féin uh, on the offshore aspect of this. And uh, whereas I would share the same concerns as Deputy Boyd Barrett and, and, and indeed Deputy Kenny, I believe that uh, keeping it simple will get it done, and that's what we should do, and, and deal with the other issues uh, down the road. Um, so it's, I also welcome this from, from the point of view that as a local authority back in uh, 2014, Kerry County Council inserted um, a clause in their county development plan from 2015 to 2021. Uh, not to allow fracking, so I'm glad that this now national uh, legislation will back up that particular proposal. So, uh, as an example to the uh, audience here tonight, I will stick on the subject that I'm here to debate about, and uh, I welcome what we are doing, and uh, will uh, pass over now to my colleague, um, Deputy Scanlon. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. That can go. And, and uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak here tonight, and uh, I, I'd like to uh, commend Deputy McLaughlin. It's, it's, there's no question about it. It's a very important bill. I'd like to say thank you to the Love Legion campaign. I know there's some of them here in the audience tonight. Thank them and the Friends of the Earth uh, on behalf of the many thousands of people whose lives will not be affected, thank, hopefully, when this bill goes through. I'd also like to say that uh, I don't agree with the amendments. I agree, I agree with Deputy Kenny and my colleague, John here that, uh, that I don't think that amendment should be pushed because it's going to complicate something that's, that's very important at this point in time and we don't want to do that and we don't do, want to do anything that will delay the bill in any way. I, 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 when, fracking was for, when I first heard about fracking, quite honestly, I think there was a, there was a motion passed in the Legion Committee Council, I think proposed by Mary, Councillor Mary Bowen, uh, against the wishes of many officials in the Council and supported, but not by everybody either in the County Council in Leitrim, because I don't think people fully understood or, or, uh, the damage that could be done. And quite honestly, I didn't either, until one day I happened to be watching a programme on Discovery Channel, PBS America, and it was a programme done on fracking in America, particularly in New York State. And it was a balanced programme where it wasn't for or against fracking. But my God, if you've seen the damage that was done to the environment, uh, to, to uh, the, the, the communities that was, where people lived, where we had growing communities, where you had schools and shops and everything else, and, and all these schools closed and people moved away. Because you're not talking about one well here in, in, a, in a sort of a big area. You could be talking about 50 or 60 wells in two square miles. It just absolutely destroys uh, <coughs> the environment from a visual point of view and from, from a health point of view as well, because that programme showed somebody turn on a tap and lighting a match and, and a flame, and the water actually coming out of the tap lit up. Now that, and my God, could not be good for anybody, and that's, the, that's where people were living. And we don't want this in Ireland. We do not want this. We have a nice green country. Uh, we have a, a quite a good quality of life here, I believe, uh, and, and freedom, and people can go where they want to go. And we want to maintain that, because no, no money would compensate uh, the people of this country for the damage that's been done in other, in other uh, countries, in this, particularly in America. No, no money could compensate. And I just want to say again, I want to again thank everybody that's involved in the campaign. We're on the crest of the, of the bill being passed. I would ask the people that have put in amendments to withdraw them so that we can move on and that the bill will pass and go to the Senate. Thank you. Let's come here. And Chuck, uh, scan, Chuck the Fergus would doubt. Well, uh, I think that the public opinion is very much in favour of this legislation and I believe that Deputy McLaughlin has done the country a service by bringing it forward and I congratulate him on his efforts in relation to this legislation also. I do think, though, that we have to get into the real world in regards to energy and the future of our economy. 
And I do think that we have to strike a balance between uh, the issues around climate change and the issues around where we're going to get our energy from. And if we all accept and we all sign up to the first part of that argument, which is that in theory, uh, in the future, that we do not use hydrocarbons and we don't use fracking and so on, then we must accept, we must accept the quid quo pro in terms of the infrastructure and the energy infrastructure in particular that will be necessary, and it's necessary right now, and is opposed with the same vehemence uh, as fracking is in some parts of our country. And I think that the, that is the real difficulty, and that uh, the real difficulty is that when the lights go out, when the factories haven't got a, the, the, the capacity to run their machines, uh, when you can't drive your car, when you can't, you know, you, you can't light your home, you know, then, th then it all comes home. So I think the reality is that there should be a, a, an intense effort by the government and by everybody, opposition and so on, to find a solution to the opposition to energy infrastructure uh, in our country. Specifically, if we all favour wind energy, and I know that the Green Party do, uh, why do we always object you know, to, the, to the infrastructure that carries that wind as it comes from more and more parts of our country, from the southwest or from the west or wherever? Like, there's absolute hostility, indeed, in areas not, not part of my constituency, I have to say. And it doesn't make sense to say no to fracking, no to hydrocarbons, and no to renewable energy. That doesn't make sense. So how do we strike the bargain? How do we do the deal? And I think what we need to do is to intensively engage uh, with, obviously, the, the height of these pylons. We need to intensively engage to the distance they are from homes. Uh, we need to look at all the issues that have been raised by community groups right around the country. But if we don't find a resolution to this, you know, we are the people who will have our heads in the sand. We are the society who are not paying the price. There is a price to pay for moving away from hydrocarbons, and that is the price that I see. And I think that we must negotiate it. We must ensure also, and I think this is a huge issue, that if, if you are in need, if you are living near uh, some of these uh, proposed infrastructures, uh, like our pylons, there should be a significant benefit, first of all, to the local community, that is to the schools, uh, to the hospital, whatever it is. There should be a specific formula that gives a very significant payoff to those communities and also to the households who, who are in sight of these, of these pylons. And uh, I believe that there should be a significant financial benefit in terms of energy supply to those homes uh, who live on or near those, to, those grids. And the reason is that if the benefit to the city comes from that grid and the energy flowing through it, uh, and if it's facilitated by the communities who are faced with these pylons uh, in their area, well then I think that it is unfair that there isn't a very significant local benefit. Uh, and I think that that's the way forward. We cannot always, we, we cannot always win in these arguments, but I think that we have to strike that balance. And I would hope that our, our debates uh, on these issues will look at that specifically. I agree that in terms of fracking itself, I mean, there has been a very poor history in, in, in some sites uh, with fracking, and with, as uh, Deputy Scanlon said, about devastated communities. But I, I have seen fracking in operation not 300 yards away from, from a school and from communities. I've seen it, and there's, there's none of the things you're talking about here because that site was properly run, because that site is meeting requirements that the local community place in it. But I accept that our society is not prepared and will not pay that price. But it's, it's not all as it's painted, at all, at all, at all. And I think the other point that was made by other speakers, that as technology changes, and, is, uh, and as it will, as we can extract energy from different sources uh, in different ways, you know, things will change. But I think the truth is the future, uh, I was only reading it there, I think, in the New York Times this week, where in, in, you know, by, by another 20 years there won't be any more hydrocarbon cars. It will be electric vehicles. That is the future. We've got to move with that. But at the same time, we have to be practical, realistic. The challenge for all of us is not to pass this bill. The challenge is to find a way to accept the energy infrastructure that must absolutely, definitively come in its place. Thank you.
Uh, next to offer is Deputy uh, Eugene Murphy, and we just remind the House uh, that the order of the House today is that we adjourn at 10.15. Deputy Murphy. Good morning, at last, Cancorla. And first of all, I want to welcome uh, the people who are in the gallery this evening, many of them who fought for many, many years. Uh, and, and, and I suppose many of the politicians are aware of the dangers of fracking. And I have to say, Cancorla, it was you people who educated me when I went to meetings in Carrick and Shannon and other parts of the region in terms of uh, the possible dangers of fracking. And once I became, you know, or I, I could uh, engage with you and, and I followed it up, I see the devastation that fracking has caused in, in, in many parts of the, the world. Uh, I was Mayor of Roscommon County Council 2011-2012, uh, and we were actually the first county, the first county in Ireland proposed that fracking would not come in to our county because it would affect North Roscommon, by the way, which now is a big tourism area and we're building on tourism and that's what we want to do. I have to say that um, we have to be very, very strong about this and I, I have to acknowledge the role of Deputy McLaughlin in this and how he pushed this uh, continuously and we all got in behind him to support him because we've seen the danger that was coming. We don't need fracking in Ireland. And fracking is not suitable for a small island country, dotted with lakes and rivers and hills and valleys. It would be a disaster for this country. And I, I'm glad to see right around this chamber that the support for the bill and that we're all at one on it, because it's something that I am determined we must keep out of Ireland. We don't have the vast areas of land that you can develop this. It would be a huge mistake in my view, to allow fracking in the country. And while I have great respect for Deputy O'Dowd, I can't agree with him on the one of fracking. I do agree we have to address the issue. I do agree we have to, you know, wind energy, solar energy, yes. But I'll tell you the one way you deal with the wind energy, and I've had to deal with this on my own doorstep, and I've paid a heavy price at times because I've tried to get a balance. The government needs to put legislation in place in relation to wind farms, and that will mainly solve that issue. They also need to do it in relation to solar. There is no planning being granted for solar at the moment, or Board Penala won't pass them, on the basis that there is no legislation. There is no legislation there. And the government are really falling behind on this issue. We have a brilliant tourism product that we can deal with and develop in our locality, in Roscommon, in Leitrim, in the Midlands and West. And that's where we, Cancorla, last Cancorla, that's where we want the money spent. And that's what we want to develop. And I have a good message for Deputy Ryan. I have a lot of the smaller farmers coming to me and saying, we know that climate change is there. We know it's a reality. We probably don't want to say it publicly, but we know it's a reality. There are masses of young people, whether they come from rural or urban areas, saying, Climate change is an issue. And I came from a rural farming background, and I accept in this chamber that climate change is an issue. But we have to have a balance, and we have to understand that farmers have to survive as well, and rural land has to survive. But I think it's working together, working closely together, that we can ensure that you know, everybody's situation is taken into account. And by the way, it's not the smaller or medium farmers that are causing a problem in relation to climate change. And they need to be protected to a degree as well. And by the way, if you look back over the years, the greatest custodians of our environment was the small and medium farmer. They love nature, and they love nature, and they protected nature. So it's very, very important that we, we, we acknowledge that in anything we do. In relation to, to wind energy, I've had discussions with people involved. I've discussed them with Quelch. I'll be having further discussions. And yes, Deputy O'Dowd is right. We need to include the communities more. And one thing that should be done and should be developed by government is where, when the regulations are brought in, where a wind farm is developed, one turbine should be given to the use of the community within a 5 or 10k area so that they have free electricity. You have to engage with those people, you have to include them. And if we develop solar energy, if we develop wind energy, we don't need fracking in our back garden and we don't want it. Gormangath. <laughs> 
Thanks, Ashley and Corley. Um, I'd just like to just take this opportunity to um, congratulate Deputy McLaughlin for bringing forward this bill um, that will probably pass this evening or very shortly afterwards. And I would like to also just to pay tribute to Love Leitrim and the campaign groups um, in Leitrim and South Romana that uh, campaigned actively against fracking and kept it on the agenda to get it to the stage that there's actually legislation going through the House to, <coughs> to uh, ban fracking altogether. And, um, Fracking in itself is not a good industry, and it shouldn't it shouldn't have been even considered in the first place. I mean, from from the proposers themselves, I remember I had been involved in it at the early stages when the proposals had come out. They had estimated that something that would be 1,500 wells would have been they intended to drill at that time, and by their own figures, about four percent of those would actually leak. Which, in the, in the case of uh, Ireland, that would have meant at least 40 to 60 leaks of different, uh, various magnitudes. Some would have been very small, but some could have been catastrophic for the communities. And I don't think that that was a, <coughs> a risk that was, that should have been taken and was was should have been considered by us when we were um, considering licensing the exploration of the fracking industry. So I'm glad to see that we're, we're at the stage where fracking will be banned here, and we can see an end to that to that industry um, <coughs> for the protection of communities and for the protection of our communities right around Leitrim and the, the, the areas that are proposed, but also as well for our own protection into the future in terms of addressing our climate change requirements. And I would like to just comment in relation to Deputy Dowd and the wind, farm, wind farming. The problem with wind farming, is I, as, from my point of view, is that it's geared up to make wealthy people wealthier, and that's the whole point of it. We pay massive subsidies in this country to wind farms. Um, for something that provides 60% of our electricity, something like 4% of the time. Um, so that, to me, is not a viable renewable energy, and that, to me, is not something that we should be actively pursuing. There is a role for wind, and I, I believe that offshore wind would provide a role, but I believe also that wave power and tidal power is what we would be, we'll be providing our resources. I don't know enough about solar, whether it has any real value or not. Um, I see advertisements up around Donegal for solar that even works in the dark. And um, I think that's hilarious. Uh, the same, <laughs> only in Donegal could it happen. But um, this is a company, company advertising solar panels for households, saying that it even works in the dark. Now, maybe it does, um, but uh, I'd love to see it actually uh, happening. But, you know, so wind energy is not about renewable energy in this country. Wind energy is about making money for investors, and that's all it's about. And, um, and the imposition of wind on communities right across the country is completely unacceptable, and that's why you have such a backlash against wind, wind energy, and particularly in Donegal, because we have we've seen in Donegal the development of 110 kV lines so that it can get the wind energy out of the county, and we don't see actually benefits for the communities. And I would love to see if many actual community-owned wind farm con projects there are in the country. I would say there's very few altogether. Um, you could probably count them on one hand. And that's because it's all geared towards making wealthy people wealthier and, and ensuring that they can, they can make money out of it and that we c continue to subsidise it. If we're going to subsidise renewable energy, we should be subsidising it for communities and for the benefit of people and citizens rather than the benefit for multinationals <coughs> and investment groups. But this bill is about, is about fracking, and, I'm glad, and I, I welcome it, and I, I hope, hope it will be happy when it passes that it is, does see an end to fracking in the country. But we have an awful lot more to do as a country in actually gearing up and preparing, and we, we need to make an, a real strategy to move away from fossil fuels into the future, and that is the only option that we have, and we need to come to terms with that, and we need to start working towards that actively. And we can do it, and we can transition away from it, but we have to embrace it, and the government has to take it seriously and um, make sure that they actually implement policies that will move us in that direction. Uh, oh, sorry, Deputy Fitzmaurice. All right. Gormag with Ms. Cancorla. I welcome the opportunity in speaking on this bill. First of all, um, down through the years, a lot of governments have come and gone. But in fairness to Deputy McLaughlin, uh, he has taken the bull by the hordens and he put a bill forward. And to Deputy Kine, or Minister Kine, um, it's a good day when you listen round the House that there's unanimous agreement, uh, which generally isn't in here a lot of the time, that uh, people agree with this bill, people support it. Um, but above all, it's a good day for 
uh, rural communities, um, the quiet people right around Ireland that got together, mobilised, got a message out there to every TD, to every councillor, to everybody in the media, um, a lot of the time through their own resources uh, of putting funding together themselves to try and get this done, um, like Love Leitrim, um, and different, different communities everywhere that sent a message out, that went to the trouble of you know, getting these videos of what went on in other countries, the mistakes that went on. And um, it's those people that uh, for once today can say to themselves that the ordinary person out there has won this, uh, that a bit of common sense has been brought in uh, to elected representatives to go with what the people want, that we're listening to the ordinary people on the ground, which is a great thing. Um, the one worry and the big worry I had in watching, and, and, and no more than everyone else, we had to be educated on a lot of it, um, was uh, the quality of uh, the groundwater for people drinking, especially in the counties concerned. Um, when we do have problems, you know, and we have a lot of problems coming down the line uh, at the moment, uh, the likes of Irish water is hitting major problems on extraction licenses, that regulations and legislation is blocking them. And they're trying to get the likes of THM sorted, while at the same time being prevented from it. And if you had this landed on top of you in the danger of damaging uh, our groundwater sources, then you had a major problem that uh, could leave huge, even counties, without good quality drinking water. And um, I think in the, the whole, uh, you know, the, the whole in talking about uh, producing electricity or whatever we're going to use down the line. Let's be very clear in it, rural communities, um, small farmers, first of all, uh, are the guardians of the landscape. It's grand from 100 miles away telling everyone how to live their life and what to do with them. Um, but at the end of the day, you go to a small uh, rural farms right around the country and they wake up with nature, they live with nature and they go to sleep with nature. That's what they are about. That's where they are from. They don't. We're not talking about these big landlord setups. We are talking about mostly where a lot of these resources are trying to be pulled out of is the west of Ireland. And you are talking about people that has gardened their landscape all their life. And I would do take offence to any of them people being criticised in any way, as has been pointed out earlier on. Um, we have Lakelands and Neathrum and Roscommon and a large tourism area in the west of Ireland that would be under threat only for the likes of this bill has been brought in. And if we want to go into energy, there are plenty of places that's a kilometre from a house that you can put up turbines. But it's not the turbine, it's the economical value of what, it, what will it do. And um, I have no problem if something is efficient and something is economical and something there's plenty of parts of Ireland, and we can get them by Googling them this minute. It's a kilometre from a house. If you can put up some type of a system that is a kilometre from a house, because, you know, it's grand. You know, people like to talk and say, oh, well, we need this and we need that and the other. They might not like it 50 metres from their house, a pylon, or 500 metres from their house, or 400 metres from their house, a wind turbine. Um, and there's no doubt about it, it but there is solutions and there's middle ground to be found. But unfortunately, the powers that be, and as uh, Deputy Pringle said earlier on, all these people in the rural parts of Ireland have seen as fat cats getting richer out of putting up the wind turbines and the ordinary person left there looking at it an eyesore for the rest of their life. There is options in the line of, uh, you know, you can put it out and offshore, um, providing that it's economical. Because we have to live in a real world that we have only a certain amount of money, we have a certain amount of a budget. And are we going to put electricity price up 20, 30 per cent? You know, let's have that debate if that's what people want to do. But I don't want to see that happening. People are struggling right around the country. And the other thing that middle ground can be got, and I know in Mead and Deputy O'Dowd was speaking earlier on, there is no reason why we can't underground. Uh, you know, we're able to do it with pipes around the country. It does cost more. There's no point in saying it doesn't. But we have to make decisions of where we're going. It's no more than a road when we build it in this country. <coughs> we put a toll and we think we're going to pay for it in 20 years. 
Well, there's roads down my way there for 100 years. So why don't we look at the long-term process? Why don't we look at it over a 100-year period or 50-year period, which will make it economical for the likes of underground, which will bring communities on board, which will bring the electricity and won't have, as you said earlier on, the lights out in, different, in, in any place, for industry or forever. We all, know we, we all know we need electricity. Everyone understands that. Businesses need it. But we need to be competitive for the simple reason. If we're not competitive, we have the likes of France that has nuclear power. We have other countries that are able to produce electricity cheaper. And we have to think of our manufacturing industry and what we export. We're an export-led country. And we have to be able to compete with these. There is no good looking out the door and saying we have a lovely, lovely country and us all having our hands in our pockets and living in a tent. That won't work. We need to make sure that we strike the balance, and the balance can be struck. But there, is, there will be nothing achieved by a certain cohort of people blaming the people that are the guardians of our landscape for hundreds of years and who have, have our environment in rural parts of Ireland in such good condition. So all I can say is that I commend Deputy McLaughlin in bringing this forward. It is a good day for the people. And let's, the, let's have the debate about where we're going in producing what we're going to produce. But it will not be tolerated. We may have to spend extra money. And I'm for doing that if you can bring rural communities on board. Let's spend the extra money oh on it. Let the fat cats spend a bit of the money that they're making. And then we might get the electricity to the part that we need. Right. Uh, no other members offering. Minister. Courtesy to the members in the gallery, I'd like to get this wrapped up by quarter past if we could. If everyone doesn't want to push the bills, I'd like to commend uh, Deputy McLaughlin. His original bill was the prohibition of, on of onshore hydraulic fracturing. Um, the um, debate that took place uh, at committee didn't include any debate in relation to offshore. Uh, therefore, it is inappropriate to introduce statutory prohibitions that are not underpinned by scientific rationale and place Ireland at an unfair competitive disadvantage by creating the uncertainty of limiting the operator's capability to assess uh, reservoirs in the Irish offshore. I do understand the points in relation to oil exploration uh, on the offshore. Uh, however, we must accept also that um, fossil fuels will play a part of our energy mix uh, over the next uh, over the next number of years as we transition to a low ca carbon economy. And I would ask uh, members to withdraw their amendments, um, would, do not propose to accept, accept them. I know that Deputy Boyd Barrett has a separate private member's legislation cur currently tabled with regard to the potential to introduce a prohibition on hydraulic fracturing in the offshore, and this will be, in my view, a more appropriate vehicle for the discussion uh, and debate on this matter. A proposer of the amendment, Deputy Boyd Barrett. You're confined to two minutes. Sorry? You're confined to two minutes. Yes, indeed, uh, that's Count Corley. Uh, and others can speak, uh, indeed. Uh, look, first of all, um, it is a good day that we have at least agreed uh, that we have to ban on shore fracking. Uh, as I said, and as everybody else has said here today, and Deputy McLaughlin. Uh, deserves commendation for that uh, and the various community groups, Love Leitrim um, and uh, other environmental groups and community groups who have campaigned against fracking deserve uh, great credit for forcing all of us to uh, address this issue, to recognise the concerns and the dangers uh, of it, to educate ourselves about uh, fracking and uh, reach this point where we can make a historic decision uh, not to allow it on the onshore. However, um, I am concerned that a debate that we've had that has included the issue of offshore since uh, at least my bill and indeed before that, and I'm sure people are aware uh, themselves regardless of my bill or uh, Deputy McLaughlin's bill uh, about the impact of fracking offshore. Deputy, uh, can I yes? interrupt you? Uh, the Order of the House, we adjourn at 10.15. Uh, I would ask you to propose the adjournment. I propose the adjournment. And I know everyone wanted to get it resolved, but that's what I have to comply. Tandala Rahu Guji, Manle Amara, and Fiokugu La de Baltinia. Egg.